Thank you, Otar. This is why the older generation has paper and not slides. <laughs> I'm Sheila McNamee, and um, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, event that we're very excited about um, on behalf of the organizing committee, who I want to introduce to you now. Uh, Eugene Epstein, stand, please. OK, now you can sit down. Otar Ness. Karina Hackinson. Ken Gergen. Billy Hardy. Mary Gergen. This is the hard one. John P. Li 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 myself and Don Dole, who's not here, unfortunately, and as those who are close friends of the Taos Institute know that we could not function without Don Dole. So she is here, I think, constantly emailing, texting, Skyping, all the details. But um, so we have spent um, more than a year talking about this conference, Beyond the Therapeutic State. And we have really been trying to challenge ourselves to create a context where we can talk about that in a variety of ways. The, the one obvious way that has already been mentioned and that we do think about is can we move beyond diagnosis? Can we move beyond medication? But there's another piece of that which is equally important because diagnosis and medication just become a natural part of everyday life when we live in a state where the discourse of psychology dominates. So psychology focusing on the individual, whether in a, a mental health scenario or in education. We're evaluating, we're assessing, we're diagnosing constantly. And it's always focused on bettering the, the person by some remedial method. And so our challenge is to ask, are there other ways to do that? Are there ways to do that that depart from that dominance, you know, having put psychology, psychological discourse on the pedestal? And is there an alternative? And what is that? And we've gathered here. This is a room filled with people pioneering in this area. Um, we have close to 40 workshops of people showing some inspiring ways of working. We have some of the real pioneers who have challenged as plenary speakers, Ken Gergen, Olga Runciman, Bob Whitaker, Karina Hawkinson, and Sammy Tamimi. And they all will be here sharing with us some uh, very creative, very innovative, and very exciting work. And the challenge we have then as a group is to not let this just be another conference where we enjoy our conversations together, we become inspired, <clears throat> we leave with lots of good ideas and then go back to the same old thing. Can this conference, the charge is, can this start a movement? The movement's already begun by many of the people I've mentioned already. We know that. But can it blossom out? Can it be? this kind of organic movement that, that becomes the norm, where we're looking at how people live in relation to one another, how they care in relation and in community, how ways of discerning what's healthful and what's not healthful, healthful is what I'm saying, is, is assessed by looking at the way in which we relate to one another rather than looking at individuals. So that's, that's the high level context of this. And it, it's such an important topic. I think we're all passionate about this. And it's, um, it's so necessary. So um, we will be, I'm actually going to invite Mary Gergen to come talk about the dream weaving. 
we're gonna, we've tried to build in a way to begin that kind of conversation of what, what can emerge from this? What sorts of uh, practice, what's, what sorts of activities can we collectively and with our colleagues and our friends and our families and our communities back in our local areas? What can we do? So, Mary? Thank you, Sheila. I brought along the dream catcher from Taos, New Mexico. The Taos Institute is named after the town in New Mexico. And we have uh, these dream catchers, which I thought would be kind of the beginnings of an approach uh, to collecting ideas. Instead of dreams, we're going to collect ideas and thoughts from all of you. We have a group of people here who will be called dream catchers. And um, dream catchers will be people who will be especially responsible for listening out for the ideas that you have that will help to keep the momentum of the conference growing after we depart on Sunday. Um, also, there will be a board. Is there a board? Tomorrow morning, there will be a board, a, a whiteboard, which will be available for you all to write down thoughts, ideas, relevant things that could bring the ideas of the conference forward into the future, bold and timid steps that might make a difference in moving beyond the therapeutic state. Um, the uh, Saturday last session before the final plenary will be discussion groups where you all are invited to participate along with dream catchers as facilitators to try to share together some of your ideas that would help to promote ideas beyond the therapeutic state. So there will be dream catchers among you, and I hope you will take advantage of it to think creatively in your own levels of expertise about something that we could do after the conference. Thank you. Is that everything? John Pihlaja. Pihlaja. It's not. It's not. No. It's, it's no. like a song. It is, with a, with a rumba of a rhythm to it. OK. Um, dreams bring us here. And let's take a closer look, a much more personal look, at what dreams are all about. So I would like you to to look around and identify a pair. Now we're, we're in fixed seating, which makes it a little bit harder to turn around and look around. But um, would you please identify a pair to talk with for a couple of minutes? Point at your pair, that way, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Hey, you're really good. You're really good because I was going to I was going to give you the next step, which which was to introduce yourselves and and so forth. Now, I'm going to give you a task, and you need to you need to decide on a division of labor here. So one will interview the other. So decide on your roles. So who's the interviewee? Make that decision now. Okay. Okay. Now, interviewers, 
Interviewers, hands up so I can identify you properly. Excellent. So you know, no identity crisis here. Now, interviewers, ask the person two questions. The first question is, why are you here? Now, wait, 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 wait. Don't start yet. Don't start yet. Not yet. Or what brings you here? Something along that line. And then when you get some answers, then take a step forward asking, and why is that important to you? Okay, so two steps. What brings you here? And why is that important to you? Uh, about two minutes, one way, okay? <laughs> What brings me here? All the hard work that we put into making this happen, and my interest in the topic. My interest is anti-diagnosis, anti-pathologizing. That's why I think it's important. I might have guessed that from the writings. Why is that important to that? Why? Because I think I've seen and experienced firsthand the way in which evaluation doesn't have to be diagnosis, but just evaluation limits a person. And that there are good ways in which to offer evaluation and feedback that can help a person grow. And there are ways in which. We've seen alternatives. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's my it is my very undialogical task to interrupt you. My apologies. Um, and now, change roles. And the questions, once again, are the same. What brings you here, or why are you here? And when you hear the answers, then focus on that. Why is that important to you? OK? Two, three minutes. Go ask Eugene why he's here. You ask Eugene why he's here. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, and you can thank each other for what was obviously a good discussion. How do you feel physically, by the way? How does this affect your physiology? Yeah? Good, okay. Well, welcome. Uh, now, a next step. I'd like you to look around again and leave your friend and find a new friend and point to that person to, to form new pairs. Would you do that, please, right now? Excuse me. Excuse me. Now, assign yourself the roles, interviewer, interviewee. Now, the instruction is almost the same. So ask the interviewee, which, which, way, which are your roles? Yeah. <laughs> the interviewer and interviewee. Okay. So you'll be asking your interviewee what brings her here. And when you hear a little bit of that, then ask why that is important to her. So this is a, person, a fairly personal question. Now, here's where it gets different. You, as the interviewee, are not allowed to say a single thing that you have said earlier. <laughs> but that makes it more important. That puts more weight on the activity of the interviewer. OK? So what brings you here? Why is that important to you? And neither one is allowed to say anything that was previously said in this room. OK? Three minutes, go. take notes on this. Yeah. Because also they feel at home, engaged with somebody, they feel like they have social connections. Huh. Oh, you want the animation and the adrenaline as part of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that.
Okay, and then switch roles, switch roles for the final round. What brings you here? Why is that important to you? And not saying a word that was said before. Okay, thank you, thank you once again, and so you can now thank each other. Okay, just a quick question, what's different the second time? What's different the second time when you're not allowed to repeat yourself? What happens? It gets more personal. Yeah. And why is that a good thing? It gets closer, closer as people. So it gets more relational. It's also more a unique. It's not something you automatically produce every time you're asked. It's something that comes up from your interaction in a completely unique way and which cannot be repeated. So uh, along these themes, I'll pass the microphone on to Sheila. Thank you very much. Thanks, John, for warming the room up. All right. Um, 
It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ken Gergen. I'm sure I am almost practically positive that everyone in this room knows Ken Gergen. If you don't know him personally, you know him by his writing. He travels everywhere, so there's probably not a corner of the globe that he hasn't touched upon. And so it's fitting for him to open the conference because this is part of his extended family, of our extended family. But it's even more fitting because Ken has spent, as, as everyone knows, five decades really challenging the empiricist tradition, the tradition that has put psychology on the pedestal, the new high altar uh, to which we pay all of, of our attention. And he, his career has, from the very beginning, been a challenge, not a disrespectful challenge of that, um, a respectful challenge of that as one way of being, as one discourse, as one possibility. But he's always questioned, and he's always been curious to question what, what could be, how could it be different? And I know that he has mentored me, he has mentored many people here, and he, in developing the relational alternative that he has developed, he really has lived that alternative in being um, very generous, very generous with his ideas and always curious, always curious and intrigued by what other people are doing. Not so much a teller of what people should do, but more a, what's going on here? This is interesting. So um, I think we probably all could tell stories of, of moments when Ken's ideas or Ken personally has um, inspired us and touched us. Um, we could tell other stories about him too, I'm sure, but those will be saved for later in the evening. Um, but at this moment, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Ken Gergen. And Ken's, after Ken's talk, uh, Billy Hardy and Eugene Epstein will be making some comments and being in conversation. Ken? Thanks, Sheila. <laughs> Those are really generous comments, but they make me feel a little tired. <laughs> um, yeah, this is not easy because I see many faces here from many parts of life, and I just want to go out and hug you and say, hey, let's talk, let's walk. So it's not easy. Um, there's one more piece of business that none of you guys managed to um, take care of. Leticia Rodriguez, is she here? Yes. Uh, do you want to stand up a moment? Yeah. I, I do this for two reasons. <laughs> one is, um, I think if I have it right, you have come from the longest distance to be here, and that's Paraguay. Enormous. <laughs> But that's not all. <laughs> today, she, I mean, she has sacrificed to come here, and today is her birthday. Um, a line from a poet, Wallace Stevens, as a way of trying to frame what I want to do here. Uh, the phrase is, a blessed rage to order. A blessed rage to order. A rage to order. Partly because I think it characterizes the last hundred years of development in Western culture, and particularly the ways in which we live. Feeding on an impulse that I think we all have, that somehow we don't want things to be chaotic and unpredictable. We want them somehow to get control of our lives. We don't want the sort of random deaths and diseases. We don't like frustrations. If we try to get a life that's orderly, I think all of us tend to do that. 
But that kind of impulse now gets sort of um, carried by larger institutions than us. So they get science, which now comes into its own in the 20th century, a scientific, an age of science, in which the prime hope is what, what, what? <laughs> you can't hear me anymore. <laughs> is that right? All right, OK. And, <laughs> Shall I start again? <laughs> in which the chief aim is essentially one of prediction and control, in which the hope is to gain control of the firmament, atomic um, structure of things, of biology, of everything. So it becomes predictable, and us. The, the immersion in social science, which is developed in the 20th century, all of which follows the same kind of model, which is let's get control of things and be able to predict it, gather data, find out what's going to happen next. So we want to get control of psychology, which is, again, one of those sciences that grows up, sociology, political science, and so on. Even literary studies become something which one would want to do with a computer. But that's not all, and I mean, most of us have benefited by that. Most have been, uh, most of us have been through scientific training. We know the logic of it. We, in fact, most of us would probably appreciate the logic up to a point. But then I'll, that now gets layered on other things like government, like the search for experts in various fields, science among them, but other fields as well which can help us, which can give us knowledge about what there is and how it can be predicted, so that government can become much more systematic, drawing from experts, giving us uh, rational templates by which we can live our lives, bringing them in to order. And that gets wrapped up with another layer of her cultural um, accumulation, which is rational thinking or rational planning. The reduction of this kind of uh, control devices into rational estimates of costs and benefits. Because after all, you, when you want to make predictions, you want to control stuff, you want to know what the outcome is. So in effect, we now think in terms of a sort of the, what do we get for what we do? How is the system running? Could we run it more efficiently? Could we run it in less cost? Could it run more eff efficaciously with respect to what we, to, in terms of economics? Now we know this in various ways as the commodification of society, as the installation of neoliberal thought. And I think um, for a lot of us more locally, it's a matter of uh, evidence-based practice, checking on you, making sure it's working. Who is it working? What are we paying for? And so on. And so all that's passed down to us. It becomes a major sort of motif of Western culture. And I said blessed rage to order because I think on the one hand, <clears throat> we all benefit from that and we love it. We love our highways to be safe and sound. We love control over how fast we can drive. We love the fact that they're policing that so people aren't taking advantage of it and we are endangered. We love the fact that drinking and driving is controlled now. We want the planes to fly without crashing. We want health protection and so on. We, we live by that. I was just thinking on the way here, I mean, I don't know how many of you took the plane down from, or the train down from Oslo. I mean, for me, coming from the United States was like futuristic. Take my credit card out and just swipe it in that thing, taking the train, and suddenly I'm on the train. No ticket buying, no punching, no surveillance. It's just boom. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but we all suffer. That's the problem. We all suffer. Because the creation of those orders also does things to us. And let me propose just for a moment that with every installation of order, there is the multiplication of disorder. 
with every attempt to order the multiplication of disorder. Because every time we get things straight, we have to move our lives in this case, do something with them, change them in some way. And that changes something else, which changes something else, which changes something else. I mean, just think about, uh, you put security systems in an airport. We all want that, up to a point. But then there are the lines. And we don't know what time to get to the airport. I mean, you, some of you have it better than others, but we in the United States will be in those lines, you know, 30, 40 minutes sometimes. So you have to get to the airport early. So you have to get up early. So you have to go to bed earlier. So you're not going to do something else. So there's going to be a relationship that you're not going to have, some work you don't do. And that's going to be something else is going to suffer, a relationship suffers, they're going to have to renegotiate, and so on. Everything pushes everything, everything pushes everything. And pretty soon we have to order ourselves, get ourselves straight, get our regimen straight. So we become an ordering device that enables the grand orders to submit themselves and control our, our beings. Um, I just, uh, as an aside, I've just been working with the school system here. Um, a number of us are involved with this project, disturbed by what this kind of ordering is doing for school systems and the way in which it seems to now, with placements of, the, of national exams and so on, which everything gets evaluated in terms of cost-benefit and lives are changed. School systems now are not interesting to anybody. Uh, they, there is no enthusiasm in teaching. There's no enthusiasm as being a student. How can you revitalize them? How can you regain something of the vitality and creativity and spontaneity that they could have the possibility to be? So what about mental illness? Now my first, I mean, I accepted pretty much what I'd learned by the time I was 17, 18, about mental illness, 19. But uh, let me just describe my first brush with mental illness, at least serious brush. I had a really good friend at college, like one of the most um, kind of unique, inspiring people I'd ever met. Highly active person who spoke in metaphors, poetry. He knew a lot of stuff he could quote it, bring into place. Uh, somewhat unpredictable because he'd just drop over at two in the morning, say, hey, let's go do have a burger or something. Always in motion, always like pushing things, poetically. And he just, my mind would just spin out, you know. Well, I took uh, Mac, this was his name, to a um, conference. Um, I was asked to help organize some people. There was an organization called the Young Presidents Organization. These are people who made a lot of money very young. They have a meeting every year. And they wanted us to give, sort of, uh, give the information out every morning, run a newspaper, get people in their places, and so on. I took Mac. So I thought this would be fun for us. And indeed, we had a crashing time with it. We'd go out late at night and take all the newsletters and throw them out of the stairwell and let them flutter down like <laughs> pigeons. It was really wonderful. Um, but one morning, I came back to my room, and um, Max doors uh, the next door over, and um, there's an armed guard sitting in a chair in front of his room. Like, and I said, I, you know, what, what's going on? You're not going to tell me anything. So I went in my room, and I'm just really worried. I tried to call. The line's busy. I can't get to him. What's going on? But I looked out the window a few minutes later because I heard some rustling, and there are two armed guards, and they've got Mac straight-jacketed, and there's a rat carting him off to the, to the uh, train. Well, I found out that uh, people had complained about Mac at the organ. They thought he was strange. And uh, he was, that strangeness was threatening to people. They didn't like having him around. Clearly, he was mentally ill. So Mac was institutionalized, and I didn't see him for maybe seven years before he got out finally. I, they had killed Mac. I mean, he was puffy, um, half asleep, no spontaneity, just sort of drowsily walking around. 
and he wasn't there. Like, what would they do with Mac? That's sort of what I feel we're faced with. It's kind of an imposition of a system which is doing things to us. And even though it has some kind of promise at the beginning, it has now come to the point that we are suffering madly over it. Now, in the case of um, the imposition of the ruling order in terms of mental illness, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting change because it's, just, it's more profound than just you know, going to the gate of the airport a little bit early. It changes a whole sort of motif or way of thinking about our lives, leading our lives. And what I have imagined at one point um, was something like we become engaged in a kind of a cycle of infinite infirmity, infinite infirmity. In which that cycle begins when we invest the power to tell us what things are in any particular group in, ter in its terms, which we did. In the, in the United States, in any case, in the early 1900s. Coming out of the medical profession, who could claim knowledge about mental illness? And so you've got a, a, a vocabulary, a vocabulary of understanding, and you might say a vocabulary of constructing our lives. Okay, it's not so bad to have a vocabulary. We all do that every day. You can't escape it. But there are a couple of questions you have to ask, like whose vocabulary is this? And what are the implications of having that vocabulary? What do they use for its basis? And I say this in part because I found out not so long ago that I had an ancestor in Massachusetts who was burned alive because she was a witch with solid evidence that she was a witch. We don't burn anymore. What we do is just put people to sleep or lock them up. And what is the evidence, after all, for mental illness? What is a, what is a mental illness? Now, all we've got, pretty much, are symptoms. That's what we deal with, symptoms, like medical model. All right, you see the symptoms, and you try to get to the base. There must be something behind the symptoms. Symptoms of something. But what are the symptoms of, exactly? And the medical model seems to work, because you can find something in the blood system. For example, if you have a rash, or if your neck begins to swell, there's something going on. But in the case of mental illness terms, what are we dealing with in terms of the symptoms of something? Could you open the body and find it? Not likely that people keep looking, but it's, you, it's a difficult sell. Or um, like ask yourself this, if you took away all the symptoms, would there be a remainder that would be the illness? All the symptoms are gone, what would you look for? Would there still be an illness running around that you want to find out about? You would never look, and the person would never care, and it wouldn't mean an early death, as it might, for example, in a medical case. So that whole model seems to be a problem. I don't see any grounds for it. It's just somebody's language applied to a set of things that we do. OK, so you have this discourse, and it becomes then disseminated. It becomes given away to the public, because after all, they have to be careful about these things and know about these things. So we have education, and that, that's where I came into this. I was a sophomore year in college. I mean, I had a course in abnormal psychology. Probably most of you did, too. Now you've got the whole nosology there. But we also give it away in terms of public health. We have announcements, but the government puts them out about how you can recognize the symptoms of various sorts of things, where you can find help for these, and so on a part of our general education, our general knowledge. So, OK, we give away the language. The next movement in the cycle is we incorporate it, because these, after all, are the knowledge makers and knowers. And who am I to challenge that with my sort of folksy ways of putting things? So we incorporate the, the discourse. It becomes our discourse, our way of 
understanding ourselves. We give away the old language, the folksy language, because that's like, what is that? Um, I mean, <laughs> you, you can't be just down or out of it for today, or I don't feel like getting up, I felt like I feel crummy. Um, <clears throat> oh, here's another one. I, I, ha I got the blues. <laughs> All right, like depression. Like if a person came into you and said, I, I "Look, um, I, my wife left me, and I've been drinking a lot, and I, I don't want to work anymore. I've just sort of bottomed out here. I'm so depressed. No problem. We've got just the thing for you: pharmacology." But what if you call it the blues? My wife, my baby, done left me. <laughs> Ain't getting up, bottle's good, you know, give me a guitar. <laughs> I'll make money with this. <laughs> you can't sing about the depression very much and get nobody want to hear it. <laughs> I mean, the blues is like an honorific. You know, I've been somewhere, I've done, I've seen it, I've seen how bad it is, I know what the bottom is. Well, that just goes out the window. Everything gets shifted over, transformed to a psychological disease model, which we now find everybody can be depressed. I mean, that word is everywhere. No one would doubt what you said that, what you, they would know what you were talking about. PTSD, now it gets to be a common thing, at least in our culture. Everybody knows what PTSD is, like what, what the hell. Bipolar is becoming a really popular thing. ADHD is just, a, you know, it's like everyday knowledge, everyday language. That's how we understand ourselves. There's a kind of, to me, interesting thing that goes on there, um, too, which is if you take the, the, the sort of common experiences of everyday life that we've always had, and you have a language of pathology, it begins to change the whole way you think about it. That is, I mean, we've all had failures in our lives. We have problems each day almost, sort of, with things happening that are difficult. Sometimes they're major, some major losses, major inabilities to control the course of events. And you, and you all right, so there, something happens, but the moment you look at it as depression, it now has a disease quality. I mean, it's sort of like nothing I can do about it. Like, I've caught something, and it's depression, and now I need help, or I need a drug. Whereas if you didn't have the language, what do you do? You kind of collect yourself, pull up your socks, get on with life, have a look what we have done in the past. Get on with life. Develop some ways of doing it, resilience. But the moment you start thinking about, oh, I'm depressed, therefore it's an illness, it just doesn't occur to you you want to do something about it. And I thought one time, um, if you had, let's say, take these some of these so-called illnesses, take depression, for example. And if you were in a, like a major state of depression, and someone said the building is burning down, I almost guarantee you 90% of the cases you run out the door. Because something else interferes, you're not going to be depressed. That's going to take precedence. And it's like, all right, I'm being doing depression, then something else, oh, I'm not depressed now, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> it's like if I'm feeling really sort of rotten one day and the dog runs, comes in, does a cute trick, and I start laughing, I'm just like, boom. So if that's the case, I mean, if it were appendicitis, it would still be there when you were running for the fire. You'd still have it. You'd still be in pain. If, it were, if you'd broken your leg, you'd still have a broken leg, and you'd be hobbling. I mean, it's the, the thing is going to go with you. But depression is, I'm not saying all the time everywhere, by the way. I'm sort of, and everything I say is an overstatement. I got that. I only got 45 minutes. <laughs> I, if I qualify everything I want to say, I haven't got past the first word. <laughs> yeah. 
So is it possible that we one could just stop, not do that anymore? I think of, of Mary, for example, addicted to smoking. I okay, smoked for a number of years, totally addicted. But one day, she just stopped. Didn't want to do that anymore. Didn't feel right. What happened to all the addiction therapy she would need to get off of that of cigarettes? Now, again, this is just all hypothetical. I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility that much that we call illness is a, is a, form, of, a form of action, of a way, of cultural way of living, informed by the kinds of categories we've incorporated into ourselves to understand ourselves. But now back to the cycle. Because once you've got the incorporation, then what do you do? Well, of course, you go to a mental health expert for help. That makes sense. So what happens then? The therapeutic community begins to expand. Um, all right, so psychiatry came into the United States roughly in the being in 1910, 1920. And it was a very small group of people. If you look at the growth rate of mental health professionals, it's like exponential. In the 1950s, there was a saying in the United States, um, by the year 2050, half the population of the world will be Chinese or psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you do in a profession that's sort of trying to be sensitive to what's going on that could be wrong with people? You develop more discourse, finer tuned, all of the addictions. And what happens to the discourse then? It moves from about roughly 30 terms in the early 20s to 30s to over 300 terms, 300 ways we can now understand ourselves as having some kind of disorder without any way of knowing that you don't have the disorder outside of a symptom, which gets interpreted in those terms. Uh, now you can <clears throat> begin to see the cycle. Development of a discourse, disseminate the discourse, incorporate the discourse, go to those people who make that discourse so that population expands so that we develop more discourse and more ways of being sick. And that is an infinite cycle, which I don't see how to disturb at this point, at least not easily. But I hope we will by the end of two days. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, I like that line so much that I don't know why. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, here's where it really gets hot. I mean, that's just for beginners. Now, in about 1987, uh, we discover medications. And you start adding medications into this because that's a real profit-making enterprise. Now you get big business into this. And then you add uh, brain science and the way the romance of brain science is now sweeping Western culture. Everything's reducible to brain. Now you add meds and brain science to the equation and you've got that cycle on steroids. It's like, <laughs> I mean, I, go, I went to a psychiatric meeting, uh, they put me in an ante room, but they invited me to speak. And arrive, we arrive at this meeting, and the first thing they give me is a suitcase. I don't want a suitcase, because I've already got one, and this has an extra baggage. And I said, why do I need the suitcase? And they say, because you've got to go to the Hall of Gifts, where all the medical, all of the med companies will give you things. Fill up the suitcase. If you walk away with all these gifts from the medical <laughs> company. At, at that meeting, uh, this is my brother's a psychiatrist, telling me at most of the meetings he goes to, 
the ratio of, of actual professionals to medical sales was about four to one. I mean, for every four doctors, there's somebody selling you some, these are psychiatrists, people selling you drugs. So what happens by between 1987, in which we're just beginning to get into the drug business, and about 15 years later, that enterprise is now costing $20 billion. Now it's between 40 and 50, at least by some estimates, about $50 billion on psychotropic drugs which become part of normal treatment. What else would you do? You're depressed? Now we find um, about, oh, I, I don't have the numbers on this. Um, uh, Bob Whitaker, who will be here tomorrow morning, has actually written the really wonderful book, basically on mental illness is an epidemic. Kids line up in the United States before summer camp, before the breakfast, to get their meds. One in 10 university students in the United States have diagnosed ADHD on meds. You take one med, and usually in a couple of years, you need another one to offset the side effects, and then another one to offset the side effects of that. And there's no way out, virtually. There are virtually, I mean, very few programs to ever get anybody off these. Doctors are afraid to take you off because if you do something, that will be sued. And there are no ways, like most physical diseases, of telling when you don't have it. It's sort of there, latent, it'll be there always, so you keep taking your meds. Mary and I raised um, a foster daughter. Her, at about, she came to us around the age of 14. Um, her father had left her and her mother committed suicide. She had no parents. She was a good friend of our daughter's. So we took her in. And she had a hell of a lot of trouble, you could imagine, for the first couple of years. Very sad and um, one might say hallucinating. And we went for professional help, <clears throat> and they put her on meds, first thing, anxiety disorders and depressive. Now, that was okay, and whatever happened about you know, five years later, she's in university, and she gets through that and goes on to have a profession and eventually gets married. <clears throat> but now, uh, at the age of about 34, 32, she wants to have a baby. But you are not supposed to have a child when you're on these meds. So she tries to get off. In life, she doesn't recognize life anymore. It's like, it, it's like you put on some kind of special glasses so everything looks different. She doesn't recognize herself. She doesn't recognize the way she feels every day. It's like begins to get at her. She, so she goes back and gets back on meds. She's over 40 now and she's still on them and never had a child how to get people off these. The, the medical profession is not helping. So where do you go? Well, let me show you where you go. Here's, um, here's a newspaper report from several years ago uh, from Hull, Massachusetts. It says, um, seaside town near Boston. Okay? This is out of the New York Times. Uh, police officers responded to a 911 call and found a four-year-old girl, Rebecca, on the floor of her parents' bedroom, dead, four years old. The police said the girl had been taking a potent cocktail of psychiatric drugs since the age of two, when she was given a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder, disorder at the age of two, uh, and bipolar. Two years old, uh, which is characterized by mood swings. Indeed, the practice, this is there a little bit extemporary, uh, indeed, the practice of aggressive drug treatment for young children labeled bipolar has become common across the country. In just the last decade, the rate of bipolar diagnosis in children under 13 has increased almost sevenfold. 
and a typical treatment includes multiple medications. Rebecca was taking Seroquel, the antipsychotic drug, Depakante, I don't know what, an equally powerful medication, and Clonidine, a blood pressure drug often prescribed to calm children down. Now, this is in fact my sense of a realization of the therapeutic state. Ordered, controlled, top-down, and we suffer mightily. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Every psychiatrist I know is a pretty good person. They're not trying to do any of this to us. They're trying to help. Humane people who are overworked and trying to help. So you have to realize that there's sort of a collaborative construction of meaning within this circle. And they have collaborated in a way so that they can, they can see the world in these terms. That is, it's not a mistake in perception. You didn't get it wrong. You can spot it pretty quickly and agree sometimes. In the same way, if you're a psychoanalyst, there's not much disagreement that you can pretty much detect when someone's repressed. No one would disagree with that. So there's kind of a reality that's constructed within that collaborative set of relationships. And it has, with a set of values, we're going to help people with this, and a set of rationalities that go along with it, a whole kind of worldview about why this is a good thing to do and what's right about it. Now, that's okay because we're in the same boat, what we're talking about here. We're collaborating in terms of contrary views. What's not right about that? What's right about the way we think, the way we construct the world? And these are false ways of looking at it. And that's the way often we look at it. They're false because some, there's some true way. Well, forget true false. Forget any kind of transcendent good because we'll, we'll, we have different values in mind here that we entertain, much more humane, humanistic, you might say, much more empathic with the people we work with. So then the question is not who's right or wrong here, but what happens as a result of doing what we're doing. That is a kind of a, re, kind of a reflective pragmatism. Given multiple realities, Let's reflect on the outcomes and see what, what the repercussions are. All right, you can get into that. Um, let me try to distinguish um, between uh, two forms of dialogue, which will help us. Imagine something called terminal dialogue, terminal dialogue in which we create in our world together kind of a cozy vision of, of what's going on and what, what our values are. And indeed, it holds us together as a community. But we close the boundaries now that we know, now that we have the good life, now that we have, a, we have good knowledge. We close the boundaries, which is very easy to do, because once you can see the world in a particular way, what any other way would be kind of like not quite right. And what I you know, see is the sort of psychiatric discourse so far has become that cozy enough that it seems right and good and real. But it's terminal. That is, it doesn't invite a lot of other viewpoints, as many of you know. Now, what happens to when, when there's what I'll call terminal dialogue? Well, two things. One is going to be opposition. Because every creation of any reality or any good is going to create something that's not the reality and is not good. 
There's going to be an inside and there's going to be an outside. And because those are, tend to be bipolar, the outside is going to be the negative. That is false, mythological, incorrect, fuzzy-headed, irrational. And we don't honor you. We don't listen to you. You are the other. You are the alien. And should you begin to speak, don't come into our offices, stay out in the street. You want to run with a sign, fine, but don't, don't get in our way. Don't disrupt our meetings. And so many of us are byproducts of that. We've been very disagreeable people in this room. A lot of us have been in lines or shouted and so on, written horrible things. Okay, so terminal dialogue is going to create an exterior which is going to fight you anytime. And secondly, obsolescence. Once you've got a terminal dialogue, once you have something that you agree in and doesn't need to have any other voice within it, over time there'll be just obsolescence, whether it be a business company, whether it be a government, or whether it be, let's say, a form of therapeutic practice. Because what happens in the world in general, the conversations continue to run. You can't stop the conversations. They will continue to, to circulate around you, and in some sense, there'll be cultural change, shifts in values, multiplication of ideas, new practices. And we're into that big time globally now with this sort of the global transmission of ideas, information, uh, values, ways of life, what to do, innovations, they're everywhere. And if you keep doing the same thing you've always done in the midst of an, sort of a, um, an ethos of continuous change of meanings, you'll be obsolete. In the same way, apartheid Africa. South Africa just becomes obsolete. The Russian state, obsolete, or Soviet Union. So there's a sense in which um, to believe anything is its death. Or to have any kind of practice which is solidified and the practice is the first step towards its demise. Now, let's Contrast that with something I'll call ceaseless dialogue. That is, there aren't any borders. There are no solid beliefs. There's doubt. Uh, there is, let's say in Harleen Anderson's terms, there's curiosity. There's a welcoming of the other into the presence, a hosting. And it's never frozen and it's continuously in motion and uncontrollable, ultimately uncontrollable. What would that look like? By the way, let me just share here. There's another little bit of poetry that I like very much, just to give you a sense, kind of a gut sense of this. Hold on. This is um, A.R. Amund's, whom I like very much. I look for the way things will turn, not so much looking for the shape right, as being available to any shape that may be summoning itself through me from the self, not mine, but ours. You can just get that image, like coming in and moving through so that it becomes our possession so that I become you in the conversation, you become me with the conversation, and it continues to move in many directions without any ultimate control, but continuously moving and adjusting, doing what seems right at the time, at the time, the moment, what's needed. One of the things I love about this conference, because we couldn't predict either what people would necessarily come here bringing, but it was all those workshops which somehow, for me, embodied a lot of what I was trying, I'm trying to get at here. 
So many of them are like talking about open. Let's talk with the people we're working with. Let's talk with the communities. Let's work with the families. It, let's talk together and see what comes out of this without, no, without sort of measuring it all the time. Having a sense of, of its continuation. And I'm, I'm just really curious to hear a lot of that stuff. I'm hoping that we can share those ideas, share those practices. Now, one last moment, and I'll, you can comment here. Uh, as Sheila mentioned, <clears throat> we had hoped um, that this wouldn't simply be a conference where we came to share things and then walk away kind of feeling great, and we're great, and everybody's great. We love everybody who's here. <laughs> But that actually, we make a difference. <clears throat> We've even entertained the possibility of uh, maybe a year to two years doing something political with this. That is bringing in drug companies, bringing in government people, bringing in insurance people, talking with people like us. Like, we've got this great problem. It's sort of an infinite infirmity created by one, one discourse dominating the rest. And we're all suffering. Can we do, some, can we do something about it? which would be in the spirit of a ceaseless dialogue, which all, everyone would be a part, try to change the sort of governmentality of, of our lives. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, we will certainly work on it, and I hope a number of you will join in to see if that can happen. But um, I have great hopes, because I'm foolish. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>